most people will know what this is, the great radio telescope at Jodrell Bank in Cheshire, a dish 250 feet in diameter, capable of picking up signals from objects so remote that their light and their radio waves started on their journey before the Earth itself even existed. Radio astronomy had its origins in the 1930s, when radio waves were picked up from the Milky Way. But not until after the end of the war was it taken really seriously. The main credit must go to one man, Professor Sir Bernard Lovell, who masterminded the great radio telescope and who retired as director of the observatory only at the end of last September. There are still some people who fondly imagine you can look through a radio telescope. Well, of course, you can't. What it does is to pick up the long wavelength radiations which don't affect our eyes, but can give us information we can never obtain in any other way. Another branch of science is radar, in which a pulse of energy is transmitted and the echo is received after having been bounced off some solid object or equivalent. For example, meteor trails give radar reflections. Sir Bernard was a radar pioneer, and uh, in fact, these investigations had a great deal to do with the original setting up of the station at Jodrell Bank, as Sir Bernard told me a few days ago when I went to the observatory and I talked to him about it. I was associated with the development of radar during the war yes. and observed transient echoes, which I thought might be radar reflections from very large uh, cosmic ray showers in the atmosphere. And since I'd been involved with the study of these extensive air showers, uh, this seemed to be a very good idea to um, use the new radar techniques to detect this ionization high in the atmosphere. So that is why I started using radar immediately after the war and uh, driven away from the precincts of the university by the interference from the electric trams, um, more historic yes, relics. Yes, indeed. Um, I, I was directed to this place where we are now. I was at the meeting of the Royal Astronomical Society when you first made your suggestion of a huge radio telescope. How was it received by astronomers? With considerable scepticism? Oh, I think so. Uh, you see, originally we built what became known as a 218-foot transit telescope, which was a large parabolic bowl, but fixed to the ground, uh, not to study radio waves from space, but to get enough sensitivity to detect these cosmic ray showers. And then further calculations indicated that uh, it would be better to have the bow directed horizontally, not vertically, have the beam directed horizontally, not vertically. And at the same time, our equipment had begun to detect these other events, a large solar burst in July of 1946. Uh, we ran into the whole phenomenon of the radio echo reflections from meteor trails, which subsequently formed an important part of our work in the first few years. I think my proposal for the telescope, uh, for which I was um, eventually given a quarter of a million pounds, uh, I think it was referred to one or two astronomers who said they knew nothing about the subject and wouldn't it be better to build it in brick anyhow instead of steel? <laughs> that is incredible, long looking back, that that was the state of knowledge about this subject. It simply didn't exist. Well, the design must have posed tremendous problems. The design did indeed. Um, in fact, chief designers of one or two very big engineering firms in this country said that it was simply not feasible to build a, a still reflecting bell of that size and direct it with precision to any part of the sky. Eventually, one of the, one of the engineers whom I had asked about this said, well, he, it was impossible for his firm to do it. But he thought he knew a consulting engineer who might be interested. And that is how Husband, husband. Dr. H.C. Husband, was brought to John Bank. And I remember the occasion vividly now. We stood by the perimeter of the 218-foot transit telescope, and he said, what do you want? I said, I want a bowl of this, that size, which I can direct to any part of the sky. And he looked at it, and he said, well, uh, problem's about the same as putting a swing bridge over the Thames at Westminster. I don't see any real difficulty. And that's how the engineering problem began. During the building of the telescope, were there many real crises, either with design or with cash? Endless crises. We, we started building the telescope in, in 1952, the foundations, and very soon uh, discovered that the, the cost 
was going to be far greater than the 30 million pounds we got, but I didn't tell anybody. Uh, that was, uh, I don't think it was a mistake. Uh, otherwise, the instrument would never have been built. It was a gamble, though. It was a tremendous gamble, because lots of people began to say that the project was impossible in any case. I think the uh, first real crisis was when a friend uh, said, look here, love, uh, have you heard about the disaster in Washington State, the Tacoma Bridge? And uh, I said, no, heavens, what's that? It was a perfectly good bridge there has been destroyed because of some vibration in quite low wind speeds. So we got hold of the film of this, and husband then put a model of the telescope as it was going to be built into a wind tunnel at the MPL. And the whole thing, the bearings, were shattered at quite low wind speeds because of this vibration. And this was one of our major troubles that added another 100,000 100, pounds or so to the cost. But uh, when, the, when uh, my iniquities were discovered, uh, <laughs> there was already about one and a half thousand tons of steel erected. I, I recall the chief finance officer uh, standing in what is now the control room, and uh, uh, clearly I was in a state of utter depression. And he said, don't worry, love, the strength of your position is that great mass of steel there. And indeed, this was correct, and eventually we... Uh, uh, struggled through to the completion of the telescope, but under the most um, acute uh, financial problems. I mean, we were, um, had been investigated by the Public Accounts Committee, but uh, even worse, from my point of view, uh, because of the change of um, direction of the DSIR and the lack of information of the new officers, I am afraid that false information was given to the committee, which led to a crisis between the consulting engineer, husband, and myself. Uh, and of course, husband and I worked uh, day by day for five years on this. And um, the statement that there had been lack of consultation, which was recorded officially in the report of the Public Accounts Committee, was entirely wrong. And for a professional engineer, it was extremely damaging. Mm. And he took out a writ against me. And um, uh, just as the telescope was coming into use, and we'll talk about that in a moment, the chairman of the council of the university who was then Sir Raymond Street uh, very kindly and in, in a very fatherly manner came out to my, our home one, one Sunday and had tea and said I must warn you Lovell that uh, this is going to be a case which you are being sued for a third of a million pounds uh, and uh, it is the opinion of the office of the university that uh, that the case will be lost. So I said, well, what, what, what are you going to do? I said, I haven't got a third of a million pounds. He said, you'll have to go to prison. And then we had, I think, the most colossal stroke of luck that uh, certainly I've ever had in my life. The, the Russians launched the first of the Sputnik. And after a few days, we got the most magnificent radar echo from the carrier rocket of the Sputnik. I still got it, showing it going over the Lake District. You see, about yes. 200 miles above the earth. And um, this was, it, it turned out, to my astonishment, that uh, this was the only instrument in the world capable of detecting this rocket. And, of course, it was the first ballistic missile. The carrier rocket of the Sputnik was the first, uh, the, the rocket of the, of the world's first intercontinental ballistic missile. This, uh, ironically, uh, saved us because uh, the, the uh, news media, the press, immediately, who had been antagonistic, immediately uh, came round on our side. And Macmillan said, and the Prime Minister said in the House that, uh, about uh, Britain's uh, great engineering and scientific achievement, you see. And so, although I had this uh, tremendous difficulty, uh, which um, was a, a great irony at that time, I mean, here, here was an instrument which had more than fulfilled all my expectations. And yet, I uh, almost wished that the earth would, would open up and swallow me up. Such was my personal difficulty at that time. I imagine that the differences between you and husband were eventually cleared up. Oh, absolutely. And, but we still had to find the money. I mean, by that time, uh, the bill for the telescope, which, for which I had only got a third of a million, had gone up to 680,000 pounds. We, we collected 100,000 pounds fairly quickly. And then we were stuck 
for the remaining uh, 60 or 50 or 60,000 pounds. By this time, it was 1960, and we were uh, part of the uh, ground network of the American space effort. We had carried, uh, come to this arrangement with, with great secrecy with the, what was then the United States Air Force. And Pioneer 5, the first series of Pioneer 5s, we uh, had the job of actually not tracking it, but actually commanding it uh, from this telescope. We sent out transmitted signals, uh, which about 20 minutes after it was launched from Cape Kennedy, the, uh, we released the uh, space probe from its carrier rocket. And of course, this was uh, all over the newspapers, front page news. The next day, the telephone rang, and um, the other end of the man said, oh, is that Lovell? Yes. My name is Plingerley. I'm Lord Nuffield's secretary. His lordship wishes to speak to you. So Lord Nuffield came on the phone. Is that Lovell? Yes, my lord. How much money is owing on that telescope of yours? Oh, well, I think about 50,000 miles. Is that all? I'll send you a check. So I said, oh, well, that's absolutely fine. It's all right, my boy. You haven't done too badly. <laughs> and uh, that was the end of our troubles. So the Great Telescope was in operation. It was used to track satellites, but that was, wasn't what, what it was for. So let's have a look at some cosmic radio sources. The Sun was one, of course. And then there are what are known as supernova remnants, each of which indicates the death of a massive star. One famous supernova remnant is the Crab Nebula. The star itself was seen in the year 1054, and this was one of the first radio sources to be identified. At Cambridge, different kinds of radio telescopes were used to identify strange objects known as pulsars, initially by Jocelyn Bell Burnell. And these are very small bodies, only a few miles in diameter, made up of neutrons, spinning round rapidly and sending out pulsed radio radiations. There's a pulsar in the Crab Nebula, 6,000 light years away from us. Much further away are the radio galaxies. Our galaxy is a perfectly ordinary one, containing something like 100,000 million stars. There are larger galaxies within a few million light years of us. One is M31, the Andromeda spiral. But there are some galaxies which are strangely powerful in the radio range, such as this one, M81 in the Great Bear, and we're not sure why. And then, still farther away, there are the quasars. These are immensely remote, superluminous, much more powerful than galaxies, and these two were first identified because of their radio emissions, and even now we are not sure about their nature. Quite apart from all this, there's a tremendous amount of material spread about inside our galaxy, mainly in the form of hydrogen. This sends out radio emissions, and has been used to plot the actual shape of the Milky Way system. And perhaps even more important is the so-called three-degree radiation, which is believed to be the radiation left over from the Big Bang, which created the universe more than 10,000 million years ago. And these are only some of the objects to be studied. And so George Wilbank has a very full programme, as Sir Bernard told me when I asked him about the current lines of investigation. Well, I think in the past the most uh, critical ones are the, the angular diameter measurements, which led to eventually the discovery of quasars, and now the modern form of those with the uh, MTI network, where you have uh, not seconds of arc resolution, but hundreds of seconds of arc resolution. Uh, you see this natural progression uh, from something which would now be regarded as most elementary to an equipment, a system which, uh, which produces uh, the most precise radio maps uh, which, which, uh, which one can get. And uh, the comparison of these with the optical objects is extremely important and leading to, uh, we hope, will lead to some definitive ideas about the processes by which the immense energies are generated in the radio galaxies and the quasars. And uh, I, so I suppose now something about, something more than a third of our research work is occupied with, uh, with the quasars and the radio galaxies. Uh, but of course, uh, we have a big investment in the study of the pulsars and, um, and, and other miscellaneous uh, topics uh, connected with objects in the Milky Way. Uh, the, it, another third of our work is concerned with the properties of the interstellar medium, uh, both 
in the local galaxy and in the remote galaxies, I mean the study of the hydrogen line. Some marvellous work has been done there. And uh, I suppose that in general, although the discovery was not made here, uh, one of the most fascinating aspects of radio astronomy today is the study of what is commonly called the microwave background, three degree background. Um, we, we have a research program on that uh, which is quite fascinating. Well, that, of course, is meant to now to be the remnant of the Big Bang when the universe came into existence. So that is uh, the uh, current belief, yes. What do you see as the future of radio astronomy in general, and Jodrell Bank in particular? There's a tremendous, tremendous potential. But what worries me is the very real danger that the subject which we call radio astronomy is going to be an, an activity in the history of the world which has been localized only to the second half of the 20th century. And the reason is uh, that uh, we're finding it more and more difficult uh, to work. Uh, I don't mean because of financial difficulties or anything like that, but simply because of the commercial and business and military activities in the wave bands which uh, are reserved internationally for, internationally for our use. It's becoming more and more difficult. And we're very gloomy about it. And all these activities in space uh, which we were enthusiastic about and which are so terribly important uh, have become commercial, military, and I think uh, unless some very powerful action is taken, is going to make radio astronomy an impossible activity on Earth within the next uh, 30 or 40 years. What about setting up, as we say, on the, on the far side of the moon? Oh, well, well, totally I, was, radio I was coming on to that. I was trying to get my colleagues for the lot, for, for ever, ever since the, the, the first um, uh, probes to the moon and the planets. And they look, this is what must be done. You must get the radio telescopes into space. And um, maybe this will happen. I think it will have to as the subject's going on. And then, of course, uh, you have uh, the possibilities of, of, of another revolution in the whole subject. Well, after all, the Space Telescope, uh, if it's launched in 1985, it's going to be one of the greatest rev uh, re revolutions, I think, in the whole history, certainly of observational astronomy as such. And then a similar potential exists for, for radio astronomy. I think it has to move out. The one can, uh, look, just one, one exciting thing that one could do I mean, how marvellous it could be if one could measure the parallax of the, uh, of the radio galaxies or the quasars. Well, you, you, yeah. one, should, one should begin to do that. Um, there may be fundamental reasons about the, the variability of the, um, uh, of, of the emitting source that makes it impossible. But we don't know. We should at least begin. And this means uh, the, the terrestrial baselines are not enough if one has to get out in space. Obviously, there are difficulties to be faced, and the problems of artificial interference are very serious. Let's hope they'll be solved in time. But whatever happens, the last quarter century has seen the development of a new branch of science without which the modern astronomer would be very much at a loss. It hasn't happened easily. We've heard about some of the problems involved. Believe me, there were plenty of others. But as Sir Bernard retires from his position as director, I feel he has every reason to be satisfied with his efforts. When he made his proposal for a great radio telescope, he was breaking entirely new ground, and few people believed he could succeed. But he did. And when the history of 20th century science comes to written, I think that Sir Bernard Lovell will be regarded as the Isaac Newton of radio astronomy. Good night. <laughs>